Hi, my name is Andrew Sears, and I'm the president of City Vision University. And I'm doing a recording of a workshop that I'm going to be giving at the CityGate conference. Um, often, whenever I give a live workshop, I like to record it um, so that people who attend the workshop could pass it on to others. So, um, and I'm going to be co presenting this um, with a couple other um, folks, Eric Berger and Jack Briggs, but they aren't here right now for this recording. So, um, if you want to get their input, you'll have to, to go to the, the live recording. Um, but let me talk about this, this topic. So I am a person who is very passionate about innovation. So I, um, went to MIT. I co-founded a research group, with one of the fathers of the internet. I did a dot com. Um, that's really one of my core competencies around innovation. Um, but I also over time have learned. Um, that it's really important to respect tradition. And um, I've seen how organizations have secularized and kind of had mission creep. And I want to talk a little bit about that. So um, at City Vision University, we grew out of the rescue mission movement. So we used to be a program of CityGate, um, the predecessor, um, the Association of Gospel Rescue Missions. Um, we have worked with over 120 missions. And I talk with probably about two to 300 missions a year. I have about maybe 300 uh you know, hour long meetings with them. And I've uh, also been a student of history um, of rescue missions. We, we have a, a, a course um, on rescue mission history, and I've read lots of stories in this space. And there's a common pattern of what happens um, in rescue missions in different phases of the overall movement. So you start with kind of the first phase, and that's the founding and um, you know, many of the most inspirational stories of the founders um, are just amazingly encouraging. And they create these organizations that are completely transformative. And um, there's two quotes that I'm going to kind of use um, in this. You know, the first one is um, from the Bible. No one puts new wine in old wineskins. Um, but the second one is that many of today's problems are a result of yesterday's solution. So as you have these different waves, what happens is you have a current organizational structure that really is mismatched with where the organization is and you need a new wineskin. Um, so, for example, on the founding stage, what that does is you have this founder that creates this amazing organization that's transforming lives. Um, but that creates a problem. You need to be able to scale that. So that's the next phase. That's really the biggest challenge of the next phase. Um, so then you have the scaling um, approach and that requires kind of a new wineskin. So if you don't adapt your wineskin, ultimately the organization is going to decline. Um, so you go to this new wineskin often that's, you know, a new leader. Um, this could be over, you know, multiple leaders, multiple generations, depending on how the organization grows. Sometimes it could even be with a, a leader who adapts and, and has to reinvent themselves and the organization. Um, and then you get to the next phase, which is, um, and this is where a lot of rescue missions and CityGate members are right now, um, is what I call the professionalizing phase. Um, so the scaling phase, what happens is these organizations, they've grown and grown, um, but all of a sudden they're so complex that you need experts in each domain. So they've outgrown not just the um, founder, which often you know happens between the founding and, and, and scaling, um, you outgrow the capacity of the existing staff. So all of a sudden there's this huge need to professionalize and it's a real need. I've seen these organizations, you know, whenever you move and you, you have a, a, a team that started with the organization whenever it was 2 million and then it's 20 million, um, a lot of the team members can't handle the complexity and honestly, people get hurt. Um, whenever you don't do that adaptation. So a lot of times what, what's really happened in this past generation and currently with a lot of missions, a new executive director comes in and they're the new sheriff in town and they say, hey, we have got to professionalize. So so that's what's happening. So, um, you know, again, what happened there is the scaling problem was yesterday's solution. You had to scale the organization, created a problem of a complex organization that required professionals, right? Um, so now a lot of organizations are in this stage. So the question is, where are we? What's the challenge now? And I've spent, um, you know, I've been with City Vision since 2008, so about 15 years. And I've been in the rescue mission movement since 1992. And I've read hundreds of books and talked to probably, you know, thousands of conversations thinking about this question. What is the next challenge? Now, one of the books that really is, um, in many ways, I, I view it kind of like, you know, an amazing sermon on kind of this concept of, uh, you know, transition is called Canoeing the Mountains by Todd Bolsinger. 
Um, and I know it's been making it, it's, it circles in, in rescue missions. And um, the idea uh, from that was that Lewis and Clark, whenever they um, were exploring, they thought that they were going to take their canoes um, from the, the river that they're on to another river. Um, and they started carrying the canoes and then they realized there's no other river they could carry it to. So all of a sudden, you know, they had a plan to canoe, but then they're in mountains. So you're in uncharted territory. They have to come up with a new plan. So, um, so that kind of gives you the big picture what I really want to do. And a lot of the focus of city vision right now has been on thinking about, okay, what does that look like in detail? How do, how do we flesh that out? So, um, as a, you know, I'm an interdisciplinary person, so I'm going to talk about an organizational perspective first. So what causes organizational and movement decline? Well, um, essentially, you have a strategy for an organization. You can think of this as a wineskin, and the whole strategy all works together. So you have this thing called theological vision, and that's kind of a technical term for a vision and value statement that fits your current time and context. And then you're going to align everything with that, your programs, your funding model, your systems and policies and your culture and staff. And what happens between these waves is you have a change that happens. So your context and audience changes. And if this system, if you have a radical change, if it's an incremental change, you can just, you know, tweak a few things here. But, you know, in a lot of those, those changes, it's a 10 times difference in the size of the organization um, or five times in or you know other things change so your your results are changing so ultimately what happens organizational and movement declines is you start to get to a point where there's a mismatch between your context and audience and you start to have a, a decline so that's essentially what that's about now for a lot of rescue missions and city gate ministries one of the best things about it is they live in this truth and tension you know it's like a bow and you know instead of an or um, a lot of rescue missions follow the and um, so, you know, truth and grace, um, sacred and secular, sharing the word and deed, faith and works, great commission and great commandment, um, justice and mercy and forgiveness, responsibility and freedom, spiritual counseling and clinical counseling, salvation and sobriety. Um, so that's really what this talk is about, is how do you do the same thing, honoring tradition while embracing innovation, and how do you keep that tension um, and navigate the current crisis to do that. Now, if I had to characterize what I think the current crisis is, honestly, compared to these other, the other crises, I think this one's actually a lot more significant for a variety of reasons. Um, I'm not just saying that, but here's what I really think is going to happen um, in the conversations that I've been having with people. Um, for ministries that are serving the poor and the addicted, you know, in, in a lot of cases, um, that's rescue missions. I, I feel like without better navigation, there's a big risk that, you know, maybe 25% will successfully adapt. Um, you know, they, they have a good enough GPS, they're gonna get there. 25% will secularize. 25% um, will become irrelevant by not adapting. So they'll hit that decline, but they, they won't compromise on their values. And then 25% will not adapt because honestly, they're in a, you know, cultural space that really isn't changing as much. Um, they aren't experiencing as much change. Now, I wanna talk about the innovation side first. Um, so, you know, I told you I'm an innovation guy, um, and we, I, we study a lot of the trends that are happening in society and we talk with a lot of our partners. Um, and you know, one of, uh, the most probably, uh, famous futurists was Alvin Toffler. And he said, man has limited biological capacity for change. When this capacity is overwhelmed, the capacity is in future shock. And I believe that's a big part of what's happening. So this is kind of a diffusion of innovation curve. And over time, um, different innovations will uh, go through various stages. But what's happened is many of the problems in society have moved super quickly. Um, fentanyl is an example, but our solutions are still kind of stuck over here. We, we need to innovate more quickly. Um, so if you look at the different problems that are out there, um, so this is a graph of the, the opioids deaths in, in America, and you can see, um, you know, starting in uh, 1999, they were uh, pretty small and then they've grown and you can see the different categories. So this is, um, you know, pharmaceutical, um, there's heroin and there's synthetic. Um, so this would be, you know, uh, pr the prescription pills. Um, and you can see that o over time, it's just ballooned. The numbers have, have increased, you know, down here, um, you know, just a few thousand and um, it's just growing, been growing dramatically. Um, so, you know, the first wave was, um, you know, prescription 
and then heroin started to in increase, and then now it's been fentanyl. So how do we respond quickly enough? Um, that That's creating a challenge. Now, um, some of you have also heard of this term called the deaths of despair. So um, drug overdose is one of the deaths of despair, and you can see that that's increased this um, line here. But then there's also been, you know, alcohol and increase in alcohol related deaths um, more more recently. Um, suicides have ticked up in the past um, 20 years. But what's they're they're combining all these and they're calling them the deaths of despair. And there's, you know, a book that that came out on this just really interesting. Um, a lot of if you work in an area that is um, you know, a little more uh, rural or Midwestern or Southern um, states, you know, a lot of the deaths of this, you're, you're likely experiencing a lot of the deaths of despair, but in er any area that's, um, you know, a lot of the, the country, um, you know, this is a really significant thing. Then you have um, the housing and homeless crisis. And this also varies in different parts of the country. Um, but I live in California and, um, you know, the, uh, number of homeless individuals has really ballooned um, in the past um, you know few years and this isn't even showing the past you know three years it's gotten even much worse um, you've had similar things happen in New York and you think about like a rescue mission um, you know a lot of rescue missions some of the biggest ones will say you know we got 500 beds or even the the biggest might have a thousand beds but but these numbers you know 80,000 140,000 um, you know, in New York, a lot of those are in New York City. Um, so we're just not keeping up. Um, so and then then we have uh, the cultural changes. And, and that's one of the most significant things. And, and we have to recognize our place in history. So, you know, understanding our place in history. And I, I uh, you know, love reading, read about 100 books a year, probably have been reading maybe 10 to 20 history books a year um, and understanding our place in history. And we got to recognize that, you know, we're you know, there's the phrase, no man is an island, but no organization's an island. And, you know, we're a part of this larger thing called Western Christianity, and that's part of American Christianity. And then there's U.S. parachurch ministries that we're all a part of. And then there's your ministry that's a part of. And what's happening is there's more challenges to religious freedom than any other point in U.S. history. Um, this is what I found just reading all these books. And you guys realize this, too. It's nothing nothing new. Um, you know, we have two politically, two countries politically. Um, there's more major denominational spit, splits um, in the United States at any point in U.S. history, except for around the Civil War. Um, and this is creating intense pressure to secularize from funders and the public. Um, and there's likely to be a wave of secularization of Christian institutions not seen since, um, I believe, since the, the wave of secularization of Christian colleges where, um, you know, just about every college today that's been around for, you know, more than 100 years started as a Christian college, you know, Harvard and all these other schools. And, uh, you know, they secularized over about a 20 or 30 year period. Um, they secularized in mass to where now, you know, more than 90 percent of them are no longer Christian. I think that we're facing a wave like that and we need to essentially be prepared. So um, so what I'm going to do is provide a lot of tools and frameworks for thinking about this. So, um, you know, I'm an academic. I, I, I'm over um, I'm both an academic and a practitioner, and I'm over all of our departments. So I'm going to try to bring in interdisciplinary tools um, in this. So, um, you know, I've uh, designed a course called Aligning Strategy for with Theology. And honestly, I think this is the, the primary framework we should be using. Um, Tim Keller in, in Center Church uh, provides a really good framework of how he's done it with his church. Um, and he's done it, you know, probably as well as anyone. So, and, and the idea is you have what to believe. So that's your doctrinal foundation and your core theology, and that's going to be your theological tradition, your organizational statement of faith. You have systematic and biblical theology, and these are timeless truths. So this is something that doesn't change, but then you use practical theology and you make sure that you have this thing that's called theological vision that is aligned with this. Now, um, the primary field, I think, to define this is is uh, is practical theology. Now, a lot of people from the business world will just call this a vision and value statement. And honestly, the the business world has lots of tools that are really helpful for generating those. Um, but what the field of practical theology and what bringing theologians to the table is going to do is make sure that these things are aligned. Because a lot of times what I see is these get misaligned. Um, so essentially what you're trying to do is um, you're not changing your your core theology, but what you're doing is you're updating your 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 vision and values and statement, and, and you're going to focus it on 
um, particular culture at a moment of history. Um, so, you know, back to that diagram that I was showing, um, you know, the whole system, the, the whole external environments change. So you're not going to change your mission. Um, that would be mission drift. Um, but then what you're going to do is you might change your priorities and emphasis. You, you might update your the, uh, theory of change. You might, um, you know, update your philosophy of ministry and some of your core DNA um, is going to be the same, but it's like you have children. <laughs> um, so, it's, so you don't want to, you know, lose the core family values, right? But you're going to have children and your children are going to live a little bit different. So that's kind of the idea um, there. So, um, but, but this is the part that I really see misalignment happens is um, it's, it's the ministry expression or the strategy. So, and that's how the gospel expressed in a particular ministry in one community at a point in time. So, and there's four components, as I showed in the diagram before, program, culture, and staff, systems and policies and funding model. Now, I adapted this from uh, Center Church. I've added some of these elements to it. Um, but ultimately, what we're trying to do is make sure all of these are aligned. Now, um, to do that, you know, what we're really trying to do is to create a new wineskin. So coming back to this, a new wineskin needs a new theological vision, right? So you're, you're um, you know, have to recontextualize. You need a new theological vision. And honestly, it's incredibly difficult and dangerous. Um, to, to do this. So what you need is you need dual expertise, dual expertise. You need to understand the how and why of the tradition. Um, and you need to have uh, strong innovation. So you need to be on top of the emerging trends and models. Um, so I'm going to talk about the innovation side, and then I'll come back to some of the tools that are used for the, the how and why. So how movements happen is a new movement happens when someone aligns a new theological vision and a strategy with what God's doing in a particular context in a way that enables it to spread. So Tim Keller, for example, he created this church that grew like mad in the middle of Manhattan, which isn't typically thought of as a place where, you know, the gospel is thriving. And then he created a movement called the City City Network um, that identified similar cultural context and um, helped launch a movement. So what, you know, within rescue missions, what, what we need is we need to have innovation hubs and sub movements. Um, and uh, essentially there's going to be, you know, there, there's different ways of thinking about that. One is by cultural cluster. So coastal cities have a lot of um, commonalities among, you know, the secularization challenges and smaller cities and rural towns. And, you know, some uh, locations are super liberal, some are super conservative. You know, there's going to be um, common innovations that happen in different um, spaces, but then there's also by function. So Christian recovery, direct mail, thrift, social enterprises, HR, aftercare. Um, so if you look at the last generation, um, there was a lot of innovations that happened. So, um, you know, I talked with Michael Limita, who's been with the rescue mission movement for, you know, decades, and he, he started in Christian recovery, you know, 40 years ago. And he said that, you know, he was considered an apostate for encouraging missions to do um, Christian recovery uh, 40 years ago. Now it's become much more mainstream. But then there's been other things like, and, and there's a way to do it that retains your core values, right? Um, but then there's been other innovations that if you look at, um, you know, Russ Reed and uh, they, they really pioneered direct mail um, that came out of, uh, you know, Union Gospel Mission. And then that spread to all the all the missions and many missions today are really benefiting from from that. And then there's thrift store innovations, nonprofit IT innovations. And what's happened in and this is one of the great successes of CityGate is that. Um, if you look at where rescue missions were in the 1980s, and I would say this is the scaling generation, you know, the, the scaling movement. Um, rescue missions in the 1980s, um, most of them are here. So what this is, is the percentage of rescue missions that have kind of adopted these things, right? Um, so there's kind of a question of what are the key innovations needed in this generation? Now, I have my theories. Um, you know, one big one is cultural adaptation in kind of post-Christian cities, as they're calling it, or whatever you want to call it, coastal cities, um, cities that are ultra, ultra left-wing, um, so however you want to view that, that are hostile to Christianity. And then there's, I, I think that, you know, on the fundraising side, probably innovation and major donors, planned giving, maybe some tech um, also. There's kind of this values-aligned professionalization, and there's program innovation and aftercare. Um, I want City Vision to be one of these hubs. I, I want us to be a hub of innovation or a player that helps in multiple hubs of innovation. So that's kind of the innovation side. Now, I want to talk a little bit about um, an, another concept is called the Overton window. 
And um, so the idea of the Overton window, it's a way that we kind of limit debate. Um, and every organization has an Overton window of norms and limits to debate. Um, you know, and I think to a certain extent that can be healthy. Um, it's just a question of, is it too narrow or is it too wide? You know, you don't wanna say that um, genocide is, is an okay thing, right? Um, so, so that's gonna be a limit to a debate just about everywhere, right? Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of times our Overton window gets, gets stuck. And um, what I've noticed on this debate between balancing tradition and innovation and change um, is that, um, you know, I, I grew up in an, a fundamentalist environment and, you know, everyone was um, not comfortable with change. They all had the ultra uh, conservative theology. Um, you know, everyone was very focused on the tradition. What, what I realized is um, over time is almost all these people were Myers-Briggs SJ. They were kind of accountant types and they kind of viewed god like the accountant like oh you got a penny off you're you know you messed up you failed your audit uh, i mean that's you know accountants are great my wife's an accountant i love accountants um but viewing god as the auditor um is not really a healthy environment so you can go to that extreme right so the tradition overton window and you essentially what that is it's primarily focused on avoiding secularization um, and then there's another group that's the entrepreneurial Overton window. And I would say this has been dominant in the, the CityGate movement. And you must agree with the need for change. I, I've seen organizations and, um, you know, even being able to, you know, uh, talk about certain things. You just can't talk about something unless you agree with the need, of, need for change. And honestly, I've seen this go bad. So I started here. So I'm, I, I like to say I'm, I'm a reformed pragmatist. I'm a reformed entrepreneur. Um, so I, I was a part of a church plant in Cambridge, Massachusetts. It brought together all these entrepreneurs. It grew. It was amazing. Um, and it you know grew from zero to 800 people really quickly. But all of a sudden, the cultural winds changed and they just decided, you know what? Um, we're going to be market driven and, you know, they called it seeker sensitive, but they were beyond seeker sensitive. They were market driven. So as soon as the taste of Cambridge, Massachusetts changed, um, which they did, they just changed all the theology to align with those tastes. And, um, because everyone was kind of in this, you know, we agree that there's a need for change. So, you know, there, um, in, in you know, some of the examples is, uh, you know, more comfortable with change, more moderate theology. You get more leaders outside the tradition. The Myers-Briggs, if you're familiar with personality type, is the big picture and perceiving changing. So that, that's my, my type. So I'm, I'm critiquing myself, <laughs> entrepreneurs. And um, so, you know, whenever we have this discussion li live, we're, we're really going to talk about two questions. I'm just going to list them here. Um, so, you know, what are the biggest areas of innovation needing among CityGate members in your organization in the next generation? And then what do you worry about where missions and ministries in the larger movement may lose their way and secularize? So this could be something if, if you're doing this with staff, you could have this conversation. Um, whenever we have this live, I'm going to be asking the panelists, um, you know, on the innovation side, what are specific steps that your ministry's taken to innovate and adapt to a changing context and need? And then on the tradition side, I'm going to ask them, you know, what are specific steps you've taken to de decrease your organization's risk of secularizing? Um, but then the larger movement is, um, you know, what do you see as the biggest areas of innovation needed among City CityGate members and your organization in the next generation? Or what areas are we not keeping up? Um, and then larger movement trends, what do you worry about where missions or ministries in the larger movement may secularize? And how do you think that might happen? or what are examples that you've seen of secularization. So um, if we're doing this live, this would be the part where we do panelist responses. Um, Jack mentioned he's gonna use this slide on his logic model. I'm not sure how he's gonna use that. Um, but for the second part, I'm gonna go and talk about, and I'm probably not gonna be able to get to this part of the presentation in the live, um, because I think that, that Jack and, um, so, so Jack and uh, Eric are gonna have um, material that honestly I'm expecting to be way, way better than mine because they're really on the ground and they've, they've done this um, in a, a much more detailed level within their organizations. Um, but, uh, but I'm gonna go ahead and kind of the second part of, of this also, which is gonna be providing tools to balance tradition and innovation. So if you look at the field of future studies, you kind of have these different projections for the future and you can kind of have say okay this is probable current trends likely to happen this is projected this is the preferable and you have possible plausible right so i started off saying um 
you know, this is uh, probable right now. If, if we don't change things, I believe that 25% will secularize, 25% will adapt, 25% will become irrelevant, and 25% will not need to adapt. So, I mean, you can, you know, adjust those percentages however you want, but, but that's my best guess right now. Based on, you know, hundreds of conversations or maybe a thousand conversations with different organizations and, and what, what they're dealing with in, in current strategies. Um, the preferable is 75% um, will s adapt successfully and 25% will not need to adapt. Um, ultimately, that, that's what I, I think we're trying to do. So, so how do we do that? Well, we need to understand this through multiple lenses. I talked to all sorts of people, you know, the, the current group, the current crop of leaders are a lot of professionals and they're really good at the business side. Um, sometimes they're really good at kind of the counseling clinical side, but we have to take an interdisciplinary approach. So, um, and, and I'm just gonna give a very high level of, you know, some of the biblical things. So on the biblical side, you kind of have this pattern. So, you know, Israel will, and this is just kind of biblical history. Um, everyone sees, sees this, but it's trying to figure out how does this apply to your organization? So um, Israel turns to God for help. God redeems and blesses Israel. Israel com becomes complacent under blessing. Israel turns to other gods. If you summarize the Bible, love God, love others, um, they turn to idolatry and they mistreat others. Um, generally injustice is, is what happens. And then Israel go into, goes into bondage. And then you have kind of this, this uh, you, you have this pattern. So, um, you know, I've read a lot of books on parachurch history and histories of ministries and histories of organizations. You know, I, I read books on the YMCA and secularization of Christian colleges and secularization of radio. Um, and I, I, I've tried to understand, okay, what does this look like on an organizational perspective? And, and this is the pattern that I've seen. So God initiates a new movement. God redeems and blesses the movement. The, the movement experiences blessing. This happens with churches. This happens with parachurches. The movement, the organization becomes affluent. Um, and as it becomes affluent, it becomes dominated by high-end professionals. So their staff and board, um, are high-end professionals. Now, one of the key things about that is a lot of times high-end professionals, not always, don't have countercultural tendencies. So a lot of the earlier stages, you have people who are countercultural. So they, and sometimes they're unhealthily countercultural. <laughs> they, they just want to resist the culture, um, even if they don't need to. So um, they don't really care what anyone thinks. And um, they're, they're fine with, you know, being, uh, you know, mis mistreated with that. So, um, so the organization becomes affluent. And then often what happens is society's cultural values change. Um, this, this definitely happened with Christian colleges. Um, and then the organization must change or be uh, marginalized. So with Christian colleges, what happened was um, they were all high-end uh, professionals and there was extremely strong sociological and funding pressures to conform to changes. Um, so, you know, they're all their friends, and their other work environment support societal changes. So you can see this happening with some of the changes, um, you know, with human sexuality and uh, definitions of marriage and things along those lines. If all their friends kind of disagree with their organization and, you know, their previous work environment, um, it, it creates more tension. And they went to schools where they were taught different values. Um, so it, it's going to be extremely difficult. So in the case of Christian colleges, there is policy changes that basically if you didn't secularize, um, you could either grow tenfold or your budget could, you know, shrink and you'd have to lay off half your workforce. Um, so it's extremely difficult, um, for people who've experienced success to go through that type of, you know, challenge and to be an organization that's marginalized. You know, what if, uh, your organization is declared a hate group, um, by your local newspaper because your local new newspaper ha happens to be super left wing and they think that anyone who disagrees with them as, um, you know, a hate group. So, um, you know, one of the changes that happens is, uh, you know, this pattern's difficult to perceive because it happens over decades or centuries. So, you know, this might be 50 years from this. So the person who does this, they think, hey, everything's great, um, but they don't recognize that they planted the seeds that created um, this. So, so the intervention points, I believe, are here. Um, you know, what do you do whenever you're becoming affluent? How do you think about the culture? And then here. So, you know, whenever you're facing a really difficult choice. Now, 
my organization, and, and I'm not going to go into the details, but at one point it faced a choice where we either could secularize or we could lose um, three quarters of our budget. I lost three quarters of my budget, um, but I had to pay the price for that. I lost friends over that. Um, I had to fire people who were close friends for, for me. Um, I don't want anyone to go through that ever. Um, so, and you know, part of it was I made some bad choices earlier on, um, that, that kind of put me in that situation. So, um, so what are the top tips to avoid secularization? Now, um, I've developed a whole course that covers this, but I'm going to give you kind of the highlights of the course. Um, so if you go back to that diagram that I said, you know, societal changes happen and you got to change, you got to create a new wineskin, right? So ultimately what you need to do is as you're changing your wineskin, you need to make sure that all five of these components are um, aligned and you have, you know, uh, things aligned to, to avoid secularization. So on the policy side, um, you have to have a policy to only hire Christians. Um, if you don't have that, then it's basically game over. If you understand the law and I've, because I went through the experience that I went through, I learned the law really well. Um, if you don't have that policy, um, or you don't later, you know, change that policy, you know, soon, then over time, it is inevitable that your organization is going to secularize. Um, I recommend that every organization join Alliance Defending Freedom. That doesn't mean you have to support all their policies. Um, they have a lot of, you know, things they advocate for you may not agree with, but they provide an amazing document review and they will recommend best practices for legal protection around religious hiring rights, which is, is very important for organizations. Um, it, 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 uh, doesn't cost, uh, very much and, um, they have a discount for CityGate members. So, um, then on the culture side, and this is honestly probably the number one thing, um, that I see organizations ignoring. Um, if your organization's in the professionalizing stage, you have to have strategies to offset the secularizing tendencies of this. So I'm going to talk about this in the next slide. Um, programs, you have to align your program strategy with your theological vision. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about developing a theological vision. Let me just jump down to this. So you have to develop an extended theological vision for your organization. You need senior values aligned, practical theological expertise on staff. Um, because if, if you're not doing that, then you're going to be a single disciplinary perspective, usually a business discipline and developing that. And you're, you're going to miss some of the key perspectives that, that's going to protect you on that. So we have a city vision course that is an inter interdisciplinary course that helps develop that. You can send, you know, whoever you want to be that values aligned, you know, uh, practical theological expertise person who's going to represent theology to your team. Um, they can take that course. Um, we've really designed that course for that person um, to help, um, you know, in, in bringing that theological perspective. Um, and then the other thing, so, you know, on, on programs, a lot of times what I see is I see organizations, they have a theological uh, vision statement or a vision statement, but they're doing programs that honestly are misaligned with what they're saying on their values and they're, they're not, you know, connecting that. Um, you know, the other thing is training your program staff in Christian integration in their fields. Just because someone's a Christian and they're a counselor doesn't mean they know Christian counseling. There are hundreds of books. There are, you know courses and courses on how, to, how, you know, the theory of Christian counseling, the practice, um, you know, techniques used in Christian counseling, and um, they don't tra train people in that in, in secular schools, and it requires specific training. We're hoping to add a post-master's certificate that will help people who went through a secular school who are Christian um, learn those things, because I think that that's, that's critical. Um, then on the funding side, um, and, and a lot of missions are doing, you know, recognize this diversify to maximize resiliency for cultural funding shifts. That was, the, that was the fatal mistake I made early, um, in, in the organizations, the, the, the parent organization of city vision is called tech mission. And early on we didn't diversify, um, avoid or be very cautious of government funding. I was always the type of person who, um, you know, my parents said, don't touch the hot pan. And I w would say why and touch the hot pan and had to learn, you know, that it was hot. So that's kind of what I learned with government funding. I got burned about as bad as anyone I know um, on government funding. So let me talk about this culture thing, because honestly, I feel like that might be the most significant thing that, that's being missed. So um, this, this chart here is a chart between professionalism and values alignment. And in, in considering um, your strategies, you have really three strategies to professionalize. You have hiring professionals externally, 
promoting staff from within and hiring program grads. And all of these, and, and what you're really trying to do as an organization is you're trying to get a balanced mix of this that's gonna create a cultural center, right? Um, so, and, and some of it will depend on, you know, who someone's uh, position. If you got a director of programs, their values alignment is really critical. Um, where if you have someone who is, uh, you know, an accountant, um, if they don't exactly agree with how you're doing programs, that doesn't really matter um, as long as they're doing a good accounting. So, but, but the, but the reality is, so, so there's kind of like, how close are they to your value? So let's just assume that you're saying you're only hiring Christians, right? Um, so, so we're not going that far out, but then what, what happens is you have this frontier of staff quality, um, that it can be really difficult to find the highest end professionals that are hundred percent values line. Now, every count now, and then you get a unicorn, um, I call a unicorn or is kind of a mythical creature that is 100% uh, values aligned and is off the scale professionally. Um, unicorns sometimes show up, but that takes an act of God and you can't build an organization based on this. This is if you're hiring, you know, if you have 100 staff and how do you do it strategically? So what, what happens is your cultural center changes over time. So I talked about the founding stage, the cultural center, I would say on average is is here. So you know, they got this amazing values alignment, man. These people are sold out for the movement um, at the founding stage. But sometimes you might have more limited professionalism because you're often, you know, you might have the majority of the people who are program grads. Um, then you're, as you scale, you start to realize, you know what, we need to hire more outsiders, um, but you're still very restrictive on who you have with them. And you have a lot of staff who've stayed with you from for a long time and they've grown with the organization. Um, but then once you get to this professionalizing, what's happened, this is actually a secularization curve, right? You look at the values alignment, it's moving over here. Now, whenever crisis happens and you face a situation like I had, where you have to walk away from three quarters of your funding, you got to walk away from three quarters of your funding and you have this staff group, they're going to be like, okay, we'll do that. No problem. Um, you have this staff group, they're going to say, no, let's not do that. Um, so, um, so ultimately one of the key things that city Vision's trying to do is to move this frontier of staff quality. So what's the solution here? Um, C city vision, we, um, enable partner ministries to increase staff training by 200 to 400%. Um, so what you do is you hire professionals and you, then you give them intensive values training, um, and you promote staff from within with intensive training and you hire program grads and you give them intensive training. So essentially you're moving everyone to the right, you're moving a lot of people up um, on this, and, and what you do is you improve your frontier of staff quality. And honestly, this isn't that expensive whenever you consider the cost of you know, this secularization trend um, to an organization. Now, another framework I wanna provide. So this is from the theological perspective. Um, so, so that previous one was from the HR perspective, um, overlapped with a cultural perspective. This is from the theological perspective. So um, the Wesleyan quadrilateral is a tool for how we come to understand truth and how we make decisions. And the idea is that whenever we come to understand truth, we combine scripture, tradition, experience, and reason. Now I use this in my course, to talk about, um, use this as a cultural analysis tool. You can think of this um, as Myers-Briggs or like competing values framework. And what happens is you have a ministry cultural center, and this is where your core competency. So, you know, you can ask a question, are you as strong in scripture as you are in reason, right? Or as strong as in understanding the tradition, you have staff who've been there for, you know, 30 years and, you know, really know the movement. Now, each of these has fields related to it. So this is Bible and theology, this field tradition, some of that you get from staff who've been with the movement for a long time um, and who are sold out to, to, to kind of the cause, but some of that you got to study history. Um, you know, a lot of the people who do, do not, they, they just don't take secularization um, seriously. It's because they're coming from this framework down here and they haven't read history. Like if you really read history, there's almost no way you can come to a conclusion um, other than, you know, that secularization is a really big deal. Um, and then on the, the experience and reason, so that's business, leadership, nonprofit management, science, social science counseling. Now, you know, again, I say that I'm a reformed, uh, a recovering person who, you know, as an entrepreneur, I was, I, I live here. Whenever I went to MIT, I lived here. I was naturally really good at these. So what I've been doing myself is really 
really investing in, in these domains. So what happens in organizations is they start off. So in that founding stage and maybe, you know, mid scaling stage, the leadership is dominated with those with a ministry background and a long history of the organization. So the cultural centers up here. Now, what happens is once you get to that professionalization stage, um, you you start to get um you know leadership that um is dominated with high-end professionals from these fields so you got to get business leaders um, experts in leadership nonprofit management you have to get people who you know have uh, clinical counseling degrees to be over over things um, a lot more expertise and you know um, evidence-based practice and things along those lines and and that's critical because honestly i've seen organizations that you know, if you're running a $30 million organization with a staff that has a $2 million capacity, it's going to wreck people's lives. So, so this is, there, there's not an easy solution. You have to professionalize, but what happens is you get leadership here that then is uneducated on the historical secularization trend. They, they believe that it's not, that that's just something that's imagined. Um, and you get leadership that has limited training and discernment with practical theology, theology and, and theological vision. So what happens there? is that you know ultimately this is called pragmatism right and i'm a recovering uh, pragmatist and what what happens is you know this this order gets reversed um you never state it that the order is reversed but what happens is you do things and if you study psychology this is actually how you know 90 percent of our decisions get made is you know uh we, we we make the decision then we come up with justification on how it works and this happens all the time on 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 why we you know made the decision so um you know so you build a big organization and then you're like well let's come up with a theological vision that fits with that right so um ultimately that that's a challenge and so you know what's the solution um you have to to move your cultural shift you, you have to shift your your cultural center you have to take an interdisciplinary approach to developing balanced vision value statements i like to call them theological vision statements because you have to bring you know practical theology to the table um you know so whenever you develop these you, you need to have organizational culture and management and usually that's the seat that's at the table often it's the only seat and you know maybe business um, but then you have to have practical theology and then there's a whole field called sec secularization studies and that's an interdisciplinary field of biblical th studies theology church and parachurch history cultural studies and so sociology and how all of those relate to secularization how does secularization happen um, so um, ultimately what we're trying to do is we're trying to build a movement that has core competencies that's huge across all these domains. Now, that doesn't mean that your organization is, is gonna be um, that big, but that's what you're trying to do is you're trying to increase your core competency um, across these domains. I'm not saying you gotta stop being, you know, don't hire business experts, don't hire, you know, licensed counselors. What I'm saying is as you do that, you gotta balance out your culture. You got yourself, I mean, I've just been sitting down le reading and learning theology and, you know, other things, so I, I know these, um, space. I, I've been going through and, uh, you know, learning more, more of the histories and learning, you know, more about the movement. So, um, so let me talk a little bit about, you know, how City Vision is trying to do that and what our vision is. So our vision is to serve as an innovation hub that radically transforms the effectiveness of ministry serving the poor and the addicted while preserving their core values. Um, so we, we want to do that at three levels. Um, so if you think of kind of an, an army um, as an example, so you have your program graduates. So we have a, a program called Wounded Healers. About 25% of all our students are program graduates of rescue missions and similar ministries. And those are like the enlisted. Now, if you have an army that's all officers, it's going to be problematic. Um, if you have them all enlisted, that's going to be problematic. So we, we serve as an aftercare partner program. Um, and we also serve as an innovation hub for aftercare and uh, program practices. And then you have the officers. So that's the staff, and this is across all of City Vision's programs, not just the Wounded Healers program. Um, and we serve as an innovation hub and training hub among, among staff to enable ministries to professionalize while re retaining their core values. So you need, in an army, you need the enlisted, you need the officers. And this is really a key thing, I think, that we need to develop within the larger movement of CityGate and the rescue mission movement is the generals. So our goal is to be a primary source for thought leaders out of the rescue mission and similar movements 
to enable the movements to continue to innovate while preserving their core values. So, you know, that that S curve that I showed you of we got to create a new wineskin, helping to work collectively with the thought leaders out of the rescue mission movement. That's really what this is about is is we're we're trying to do that. So, um, you know, what are some of the, the possible key innovations? Um, you know, I mentioned cultural adaptation in post-Christian cities, uh, you know, innovation in major donors, values aligned professionalization. And, and we think that City Vision can be a, a part of that. And the way City Vision does that is our Wounded Healers Program um, works with program graduates. Um, then for staff training, all of City Vision programs, and we're an innovation hub for staff training. We have a retail management certificate for thrift store staff, a food services certificate for food services staff, a, develop, a fundraising and development certificate for development and fundraising staff. And then if you have internal training, um, then we can provide uh, credit recognition for that. So ultimately, that's what we're trying to do is to create kind of this vision working with you on that. We believe that we, we can um, provide that shift to the desired future. And um, we just want to partner with you on that. So um, thank you and hope you find this, this uh, workshop helpful.